all for one family on stage. Their first gig, The Cars. It didn't go in that we could actually be meeting our producer or that this could be a major record year for us. If you feel the emotion in every song, you give across the emotion of the song. You have been a wonderful audience and we will remember this. We will be back. When you're put in a situation where you have to perform, where you have to deliver, no matter what, if something happens. That's why we're doing it. We're doing it because we love it. Hi, this is Ryan Freeland. I was a second engineer for Bob Clearmountain on the Coors Forgiven Not Forgotten, and you are listening to Coors Cast. Hi, welcome to episode two. It's been incredible to receive such feedback from the first episode from all four corners of the world, hundreds of fans who have listened to episode one now um, over these last weeks. Such an outpouring of appreciation that I can only be humbled by and give you my thanks for. It's incredible and a joy to read how listening about this album and this band we love is affecting you. Thank you so much. It's been amazing to experience the diverse locations that have been listening to episode one be united in appreciation for the band that many of us have loved for nearly three decades of our life. Um, Specific countries come to mind that I know have listened, like the United States, uh, Spain, Australia, France, Germany, Brazil, the Philippines, Chile, Egypt, Mexico, Indonesia, Hong Kong, Singapore, Czech Republic. I could go on. I could really go on for ages listing all the countries, but I do have to give a special mention to our one listener from Dundalk. And when I saw that a listener had been listening from that hometown, yeah, that that made my day. That made my day. Thank you, listener in Dundalk, whoever you may be. A surprising outcome from producing episode one was being reached out to by people that I'd lost contact with over a decade ago. It was amazing to realise that the very things that drew us together in the first place, those being adoration for this music, this band, and specifically this album, were the very things that were bringing us back together to again continue that discussion as if we'd never stopped nearly a decade later. If you haven't already listened to episode one, I'd urge you to go back and listen. In this episode, we talk to five-time Grammy winner Ryan Freeland. We discuss his background, his journey into music as a career, and specifically his work on Forgiven Not Forgotten. Enjoy. Thank you for taking your time today. It's really Really lovely of you to to spend some time talking about something that's now 25 years old. Great to have you on the show. I guess the first thing I'd like to ask is your background. How did you how did you come into working in the music industry, um, and then specifically into mixing, and then finally on to how did you come in to working on this album? I know that's quite a big story, um, but just a bit of background about you prior to to where you came into this album. Right, well, I was, uh, uh, my mom started me on piano at six years old and uh, I just kind of stuck with it. It was all classical playing. And I, I, once I got to the point where I could use uh, playing piano and music to, um, I don't, I don't, it's kind of weird to say as a companion, but as a, that was like my, it became kind of my best friend in a way. like. Mm. Anytime I was going through anything, I would sit at the piano and I would play and or I and uh, I got my first four track recording machine by mowing lawns and my dad helped me. I painted the house and I got a microphone, you know, stuff like that. And uh, so it went from playing piano to wanting to start documenting stuff um, more so than just using um, an old reel to reel tape machine. And I used to bounce between machines and all that when I was a kid. And so it just evolved and, and, and somehow uh, engineering was the thing that stuck with me. I was like, you know, you'd look at the albums and I'd, be, I'd see engineer and I'd see studios and I'd see the guy, mm-hmm. pictures of the, the person at the console. And I'd think about the technical side of it. And that would just, even as a very young person, I thought, wow, that looks like a really cool uh, job. Mm-hmm. And I really was excited about it. And then messing with microphones and trying to figure out how to capture sound with microphones and um, and bouncing. Once you once you could start uh, easily multi-tracking on those early cassette multi-tracks, uh, my brain exploded. And I thought that was just about the coolest thing I'd ever uh, experienced, which is funny. Now I see my kids uh, doing it on iPads and they don't even seem that impressed by it. <laughs> but, 
at the time, at the time, being able to do a four track recording was, uh, um, was really exciting. So I just had a bug for it and I, and I loved it and I loved particularly sound. And I remember, um, listening to albums and the thing I responded the most to about the album more so than the performer or the song was how it sounded coming out of the speakers to me. Wow. And I don't know why, but there was something about like, I, I remember thinking, wow, that's a great song and a great band, but that I don't like the way that record sounds. And so I wouldn't listen to it, even though I, I could, I could know that it was a great song by a great mm -hmm. band. Uh, the, it had to also sound good for me to, uh, to like it. And was that even from a very young age, that kind of awareness that this doesn't sound good enough? Yeah, well, it, I, built my, I built my first studio at 12. Wow. 12 years old, I built my first studio in the basement. So I, I had been thinking about it for years, be for at least a year or two before then. Um, and it's weird, yeah, I don't know where that came from, but that was the thing that I had in me based off my love of music and sound and the way um, frequencies interacted and the way things came through speakers and the emotion I got from the sound. And so I just pursued it. I, I, I went to a, um, um, a music high school, Interlock and Arts Academy for piano. Oh, nice. Cool. And uh, everybody there needed, by the time we got to senior year, everybody there needed audition tapes for their colleges. And I recorded everybody's audition tapes and, wow. you know, and I, I was in bands and we recorded, we, you know, we'd go into the, the, the gym or the theater or whatever, and we'd make records on the, the same exact little cassette four track I had from when I was, from when I was younger. And then I went to college for, I went to Cal State Chico for me, it was a music degree, but a, um, a focus in recording arts. And uh, I did four years there. And then I just got, you know, from graduation from there, I went in um, to I got a job as a runner at a studio in Memphis and that studio was owned by Gary Bells who was friends with Bob Clearmountain mm. and Bob needed a new assistant was talking to Gary and Gary was like oh we got this great guy Ryan from Cal State Chico you should talk to Chico and get another guy from another person from their program and I got wind of this and I don't know uh it was one of those when you're really young and obsessed and focused and driven I just was like I'm gonna call Bob I'm gonna call I'm gonna call and say I want that job because I was like I want that job I want to be in LA I want to work for Bob Clear Mountain and so I called him and uh after I did a couple calls and was like oh I didn't get the job you know didn't hadn't heard anything oh, I didn't get the job um and the next thing I knew I got a I, I called back just to I was like they have to I need them to tell me I didn't get the job I need to hear that I can't just let this like disappear and I called and it was kind of like, hey, what, when are you showing up? We need, you know, we're starting Springsteen uh, next week. We need you down here by Wednesday or something. And that was it. And I, I told Gary I had to leave. I had to take the, the, this new opportunity. And I packed my car and I, I drove down there. Uh, and it was really bizarre thinking about it now because, like, my parents would be like, well, where are you working? I'd be like, I don't know. Like, where, where, how much is he going to pay? He's like, I don't know. Like, well, where are you going to listen? Like, I don't know. I didn't know any of that stuff. All I knew was wow. Bob Clearmountain uh, said yes to me being his assistant. And I'm going to go down there and, and do that. And so that's basically what I did. I drove down, found a place to live and, and got, went there my first day. And just, did, we, we spent three years uh, working together. And one of the things that came through during that time was uh, the Coors album, wow. which um, was a was a highlight of the of the of that time. There were tons of great records, but that was definitely one of the one of the highlights. And what age did you start working for Bob as the assistant? God, I would have been. Uh, it was six months after college, so I would have been twenty three or twenty four. Wow. Yeah. It's I, I I've been hearing this story a lot with interviewing people that it's you know what what they what they've gone on to do greatness with. And obviously yourself now, five times Grand, Grammy Award winning. Um, oh, it, it's something that started at a very early age and there was never any other question. It was like, that's what I'm doing. And it, it's yeah. very, not linear, I guess, but it, it's very focused, very, there was no question. I'm, I'm definitely going to be doing that. That's, that's what I'm doing. And the example you've given of just sort of like, oh, right, that's Bob needs an assistant. I'm going to go for that. 
all right, I'm definitely been hired by Bob. Right, everything else is dropped. This is the focus. This is the, and I think that's something that's incredibly lost this day and age in that freedom to just still pursue what you want. Yeah. And just single-mindedly just do it, even from a very young age. Well, it can't be that, well, the other thing kind of along those lines that I thought was interesting is after I was there and working and, and the Bob studio was beautiful and I was like, oh, this is a beautiful studio. But we were doing these projects and people were driving up and they had all these such fancy cars. And I, and I was like, all these people seem like they have a lot of money. And that was the first time after having gone all through high school and all through college and all the work I'd done that I was like, wow, you, you, can, make, you can make money doing this job. <laughs> it never occurred. I had never thought of anything about money with the job ever. Never <laughs> occurred to me that it was a way that you could, you could actually make a really good living well, at, the, at that time. It's That's not the same yeah. now, but, but uh, and I always thought that was funny. I was like, it's, I was like, I, you've, you've worked this hard to get here, but you never actually like thought how much that if you could actually make a living doing it or not. So you're doing a couple of records. How many records do you say, would you say you've worked with with Bob before the cause have come in for Forgive Not Forgotten? Oh man, I, I don't actually remember. It seems like it was kind of in the middle of the run mm. or kind of early to middle. I mean, we did Springsteen. We did like some Madonna stuff. We did uh, Bon Jovi. We did some Rolling Stones. We did like an Elvis tribute record. That was an early one. And then... <laughs> Yes, and then the cores were kind of uh, kind of early in the thing. Um, yeah, so there was, uh, and I I I loved the whole story when they came in, um, just about how like like because they had such a passion for it, and it's similar to what you're talking about. They had like a real feeling about themselves, not so much like in a um, egoy way, but in just a like we we this is what we do. Mm. Like let's not you know, let's not be shy about it. <laughs> like, let's go out there and like, and like, and see what, see what happens by, by being proactive. And uh, I really liked that part of their story um, and how they were able to come, you know, like otherwise they would have, they would have not, um, they wouldn't have gotten the international uh, mm. um, stage that they've gotten as opposed to just be staying really great. Obviously they'd still be really great, but yeah, being able to be, being able to will themselves onto the international stage was a very inspiring story for me as a, as a 20 year old uh, person. And Jim, and then they were so sweet to me too, which um, was obviously at the age I was with, with, uh, with that group was really fun, fun for me because they were, they were, I don't think they were, they were about my age, I think. Or, or younger. Yeah. I think Jim was around yeah, was really younger. Uh, Jim was around your age and Sharon and yeah. the others were younger. They're literally just out of school. This was their first, yeah. first four years yeah. into the world. And then suddenly from mixing in a bad back bedroom, a, a corner away from their family home to suddenly now being co-producer credit with David Foster on, on a, an album is just yeah huge jump massive huge jump so yeah and good for david to allow jim to maintain you know like it was that they had a they from what i saw they seemed like they had a nice uh balancing thing where they both really respected each other and they weren't it didn't feel competitive or sometimes you get into things like that and it's like it's about it's some it's about it being somebody's idea more so whether it's a good idea or a bad idea or whether it could be adjusted and those two david and jim seemed to always um have a nice balance between when when they agreed and when they disagreed and what the solution to the to the disagreement was basically one two one Brian, one strings down a little bit A little bit more, tiny bit more. Yeah. It's okay. Okay. Click. Um, yeah. It's Click. the same as it was, so yeah.
can you remember any specific examples of that where there might have been disagreements or changes for tracks or anything like that? Nothing, nothing specific. I just remember generally, like, because it was, um, it was such a, a love child for Jim. It was like, he had obviously like, you know, his blood, sweat and tears were in it. Yeah. But he also like acknowledged that he, he, he had allowed all these other people in to, to be able to have some sort of like thumbprint on, on it. And I, and um, he didn't, he seemed, uh, I can't think of a good, but he, he, was, he was very, very open to all possibilities. He was firm when he, like, I remember him being firm when he really felt like something wasn't right, but he didn't get uh, ego -y about it, which I guess kind of makes sense at that stage in your yeah. career. But I mean, David didn't seem ego -y about it either. And, 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 and that, uh, I always liked that dynamic in the studio. As soon as people have egos and, and stuff, it gets really uh, much harder to, to make great art, I think. Mm, mm, all around. So, yeah, I don't have anything, I don't have a, a specific example, but I do remember just enjoying the, the, uh, the mood. The mood on those sessions was always very positive and uh, very artistic and very, um, uh, committed to making something great, which mm -hmm. I like. Um, coming back to the, let's say the mixing and the sessions themselves, was it a case that they had had recorded a full album and then that's where you and Bob came in? Basically, yeah. But yeah, they, the, they, the recording was all done. I don't think we recorded any extra bits. But yeah, it was all done and then we, we mixed it and then it was like, especially that album, the um, mixture of some of the traditional songs with the more of the pop stuff, like trying to figure out uh, how it made sense to kind of inter interweave all those things um, was kind of interesting and, and a bit tricky. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, I was, that all we were doing was mixing. So, but they were all there, which was great. And um, wow. yeah, and, and yeah, we just, Bob worked away and I helped him. <laughs> This is great. Why not? Why not? My role. <laughs> this is good. Um, so yeah, so in, in, to your memory, they've got a full album and they're like, right, we need to get this mixed so we can hear what the sound's like and, and, and finish it from there. Was it a case that, um, that you produced several mixes of a certain song and then they chose from them? Or was it a very active in the studio, right, this is what it's sounding like on this mix. Oh, okay, let's go back, scrap that. We're doing another one. Or is it tweaking as it went on? It's a, it's always a little little bit of all of those things. Usually, like it, back in that time, it was all um, well. Bob still mixes this way, where it's all uh, it's all analog for the most part. So the so you do your best to get it done, like in that day, or if it takes two mm -hmm. days or whatever. So you spend a lot of time like pushing and tweaking and and trying to get it done. Um, but then if like a week later you got to bring it, that was a big part of what I did was trying to get all trying to get the mix to sound like it did the previous week or the previous month or whenever mm. you recall. And that used to, there used to be a real art to that, which is now uh, nobody cares anymore because <laughs> the computers just bring it all back instantly. Mm. Um, but at that time, there was a real art to, to, to taking notes and making sure that the mix could come back as close to what it sounded like uh, as possible. And then you could continue to tweak it and you do versions and then you people listen to the different versions and, and you talk about what it what it means, and sometimes um, uh, what I've found definitely is that uh, by the time you get to the end of an album of mixing an album, not that one because I didn't mix it, but uh, the ones that I have, sometimes you've learned so much that you kind of have to go back and re kind of re finesse the whole wow. thing to kind of fit to fit in a new. What it all has to kind of work together, and um, forgiven not forgotten is a tricky one because of how how different all those little. The songs are all pretty different. And so Bob, I, I don't remember him struggling with it, but I think he did a really good job at, at making all those uh, things make sense together with all those different kind of um, Very much approaches. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. There's an incredible skill in that. And it really lends to the overall listening experience, really does. Um, right. You mentioned the um, traditional pieces, which are weaved, the album obviously starts and ends with traditional pieces, with traditional pieces weaved throughout as well. Yeah, well, that part always did strike me as a little, I mean, the whole, I, I, like, I like it, but the whole thing did strike me as a little strange because it was like, instead of, instead of allowing, I mean, it's a classic old, old school thing that like, oh, you know, can't go on that long with that, 
you got to get back to the, you know, it's like that old, mm-hmm. old record making me like, okay, get back to the, get back to the hit, you know, yeah. like enough of this, enough of this enough traditional, of this stuff. traditional yeah. Irish stuff. You yeah. had your minute and a half, like fade it out. Let's get on to the next one. Literally so, that, that is literally yeah. it. That it was, I was like, oh, can't they, you know, the thing's only like three minutes long. Like you couldn't like, yeah. just let it go for three minutes and then let that be, especially now. Cause I've worked on, I've worked on some full traditional type Irish music records. Mm. And uh, so it's, I mean, whole albums of that are great. I think that's probably why Jim really wanted to, uh, and plus it's their heritage. They, you know, you want to, you know, you don't want to like, um, you want to have part of that is a big part of who they are is mm. art of people. So definitely. Yeah, I can see why he really want, wanted that stuff on there, but I'm sure it was uh, not the record company's first choice. But my memory is that they went through like a lot of approaches on how to make it make sense. Because like I said, it's not a, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> you know, it's, it's tricky to go from a, like a full on, very, very produced pop uh, tune to something very traditional. Record, it was recorded onto analog. They've got their rough mix together. It's been given to Bob. How does then, how do you, as the assistant, what do you physically then do? Do you have to get those tapes and then put them into a bank so that they're ready to mix for Bob to, to play with or? Yeah, so everything would get transferred. He had a, a Sony, Sony 3348, which is a 48 track digital machine that we transferred everything to that. And then, uh, and then you route it to the console and you, mm-hmm. you get all the stuff plugged in the way he likes it. And then he comes in um, and starts mixing. So every day, usually you'd spend a day on a song and then do, do a day or two of recalls at the end. Uh, so yeah, you do that and you take notes on the mixes and you make copies. I mean, it's kind of funny to talk about it because it's like, it, it, uh, assistant to a mix engineer is not, quite as interesting as being an assistant when you're in a working studio that's doing tracking and there's bands coming in and microphones and there's a lot more work mix assistant is more um brainy it's not that physical like you're you're like I'm, i spent most of my time watching him and learning and um i used to do this thing where i'd set the i'd kind of set the faders up to begin with before he'd come down to kind of get used to the song and think about it and see what i start thinking about what i might do to it Nice. And then he would come down and then I'd watch what he did with it over the course of four, four, five, six, eight hours or whatever. Wow. And I would just kind of, and, and get used to the hearing, you know, like hearing the nuance, like, Oh, I see he's done this to the drum or, Oh, I see he tried that reverb and then he didn't like it and he took it away and he, now he's trying this reverb and mm-hmm. you really do learn. I mean, that, that's a valuable um, time spent, you know, watching somebody that's at that that uh, proficient at their at their uh, skill, um, be able to spend that much time kind of studying them. Uh, we didn't talk much. He's not much. He wasn't much of a talker, uh, so he wasn't like teaching you anything. But you could learn from watching him. And he was very generous with his uh, allowing me to kind of do what I thought I needed to do the best job that I needed to do. He was always very supportive. I'd be like, oh, I mean, I could have said any i could i would be like oh if you know if only we could move this wall here he probably you know he probably would have been like oh let's get a guy in to help move the wall <laughs> he, was very, he was always very like uh interested in making things better which is another kind of an engineering mm. thing it doesn't work in all uh, parts of life but that impulse to always try and um make the best of something is 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 uh is fun it's fun to always kind of be striving for the best thing you can get even if and and to fight really hard for just like just the smallest little increment better is worth is worth fighting for Mm, mm. and there's sometimes that lends itself to an ocd obsessive compulsive kind of thing but there's also something kind of artistic about it where even even one little hair out of place you can go like you know it's worth it's worth spending an hour on that one little thing Mm -hmm. because then it'll be it'll be right as opposed to wrong you know, and there is, and, and that I always liked uh, um, watching Bob work. He was always willing to like uh, um, go the extra mile to make something, you know, sit right. I never, I'm, I never saw him be like, oh, that's good enough. I'm going, you know, it's, mm-hmm. he, he never, he was always pushing yourself to every little project, every little thing. It was always like, let's get, let's make this the best we can. And the beauty of that is you never have any regrets. Even if you listen to it, 
later and go like, oh, that doesn't sound good. You're like, well, I did the best I could, you know. You never sit there and go like, oh, I probably could have worked harder on it. You never have that. You never have, you never get to say that because you're like, I worked the, I worked my hardest and I'm still not sure it was that good. And and so then you can kind of look at yourself and be like, I got to get better. Back then it was all real time. So somebody would get, um, somebody would give you a list of the songs they wanted in the order they wanted and the version and the mixed version they wanted. And he, uh, there was a bank of, I think four cassette machines, the task, the classic task can cassette machines. And he had to all make sure each one was aligned and each one was biased correctly. And then you would simultaneously in real time, go down this checklist of songs and mixes and, and you could make four copies at a time. And God forbid they asked for five copies because then you had to do the whole thing. Never again. Yeah, yeah. It would have been just as easy to make eight copies, but yeah. they asked for five. <laughs> <laughs> So that was always interesting. And then, and then there was always that weird thing. People would listen to cassettes and be like, the cassette sounds different from, you know, the mix. And you're like, yeah, cool. Because the cassette uh -huh. is a cassette. Literally. It's, it's, <laughs> different, yes. it's a different way to play back music than mm. the CD. But we had just gotten the first CD uh, recorders back then. And they were, they were real time as well. And they would do one copy at a time. And you had to you had to make sure everything was pristinely clean. You had to air blow everything. It was just really because it could get to the end and then have a failure after an hour of burning a disc. It could fail at the end, and then you have to sit there another hour waiting for it because it's important. You know that that's the other thing that um, I feel with the amount of music that gets to be recorded and released, it doesn't the it becomes a little. Uh, a little more temporary in a way it's like it doesn't mm. seem like as critical to archive it yeah um where when i got started i always had that well like this album's a good example where you're like 25 years later somebody might be still be interested in this yeah so i better i better like make sure i i i've got it documented and that it's right you know because you never know radio edits any idea would that have been handled by bob yeah i mean we did yeah. do radio edits because we would take the yeah we would take the master mix and then we would edit it and then we would deliver those alternates to mastering so the the edits were done because you never I, you kind of have to because you never know like sometimes um depending on the edit that people ask for there's sometimes you have to change the mix a little bit mm. to get the edit to work so if somebody asks for a chop that then there's a reverb tail thing that doesn't work you have to you have to reprint a mix that doesn't have that reverb tail so that when you edit it it goes away those, those are all things that you have to do in the mix stage to make sure it all works um and it was much more difficult to do back then uh now it's like editing is like so easy but um at the time it was it, it took a lot especially when it was found as before pro tools it was sound designer and it was really bizarre because it was like if somebody was like oh i want to get i want to get rid you know i want to cut the bridge in half you'd have to say okay well you'd have to tell the computer like okay keep the start of the song up to the middle of the bridge and then keep the end of the bridge to the end of the song but get rid of everything else and every time i did it, i was like why don't i just tell it i don't want the, this part why am i telling it everything i want to keep Literally. as opposed to everything i want to get rid of that was one of those early computer things like this. This is whoever came up with this was just bizarre. Mad, yeah. <laughs> You're focused on what you want to get rid of, not what you want to keep. It's like, just switch your mindset. Crazy. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a weird, weird machine. It really is the, the music industry and how the, the tools to create what we want have evolved over even the last sort of 20 years has just been phenomenal. Absolutely. Yeah, well, that that is. I mean, it's really all different now. I mean, Pro Tools was just getting started back then, and uh, there were specific guys that would get hired just to be Pro Tools operators. It was an entire like separate job. Um, and then and then like us young engineers, because it was the tool, we all we were all good at it. So I, you know, I never needed a Pro Tools operator. Like, I, yeah, I would do it myself, but. I remember how weird, how oddly it warped my musical mind, like, because um, music was, it was just different. Like, so you go from like recording music on tape and thinking of it 
kind of linear in a linear fashion. Mm. And when people are asking you for markers, you're thinking about time, like, okay, well, the first course starts at one minute 40. Like you're thinking of all these time markers in your head. It's all linear and you have to roll back and you maybe you overshoot it. And then there's all that stuff. And then after a year of just having it all on a computer where you can, you can basically n- manipulate any aspect of it is a very different mindset from, from a linear mindset. A random mm-hmm. access mindset is different. And I used to have weird dreams about it. I used to wake up like feeling weird that I could take bass parts and line them up with kick drums and stuff. It was just like, that was just a really weird idea 25 years ago. I think that was the other satisfying thing with the, that Coors record is how successful it was because it was, I think there were a lot of people that saw it as a, a passion project for David mm-hmm. and not necessarily anything they were ever going to like, ever going to make any money back on or any of that stuff. They probably, you know, there was, I don't remember feeling a lot of enthusiasm from anybody other than the people that were actually making the thing. Mm. Uh, and that is always fun when something that you know that kind of unexpected happens like that so they're hiring you know they're hiring they're kind of like they're you know they're they're doing the work but they're not like let you know they're kind of like doing it in a way that's probably easier and more affordable so that's running a ton of money onto something that ended up being a very successful thing Mm. Mm -hmm. and that's kind of always that's like a fun part of the of the record making process is because you never know, you never know which one's going to hit with an audience and which one's going to not hit with an audience. Literally. Yeah. 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 And ones that hit, you, you don't always know why they hit. I mean, you know, it's like, it's a funny little thing. People just get, people respond to certain combinations of uh, variables and ways that, that is meaningful to them. Like, I never know why there's stuff I like. It was always, it was always at the, any, anytime there was a single, somebody picked a single, I was always like, Oh, like nobody ever picked my favorite song on the album. Yeah, never, never once in all my years of working. I was like, what's your favorite song? It's like, well, that one is like, well, no, that, we're enjoy. never going to release that as a single. <laughs> Do you have a standout track on this album? Well, that, I was thinking of that, saying that Runaway was probably one I liked. Yeah. That was probably my favorite song, which we actually did okay. I would run away. Yeah, that's the one I, I like the ones I I forget some of the other but the ones that were the ones that did the the nicest marriage of the like the like this the very um uh pop more straight ahead pop but with combining more of the traditional elements mm. those are the ones that I was like okay that's a cool to me that's what the cores were it wasn't just like let's like it was the ones that are just more straight ahead and have all the more of the traditional pop with the guitars and stuff mm. kind of lose some of the more traditional melody um, and instrumentation are still great, but those, those didn't speak to me as much as like Runaway had, had a nice combination. I thought it was a very, yeah. very well-crafted uh, production and, and, a, and a marriage of, of and, and it, well, it didn't sound like anything I'd heard before. That's mm. the other reason I liked it. It has a very, like new at that time it was like wow this sounds like this band to me like uh, you yeah. know even yeah. though i hadn't nobody had heard of the band before mm. to your recollection how long was the mixing process i don't remember exactly and my guess is that it was uh two weeks that's about we do about two to three weeks for a record you do like a song like i said a song a day so mm. Mm. 
like a 12 song record takes about two weeks and then you have an extra day or two with the b side you've probably got 17 tracks in total on this one yeah so it could have been closer to three weeks probably back then with cassettes and with vinyl but not so much in this case but cds there's a there's obviously a limit on how much capacity there is on a single side of a cd or a vinyl uh, yeah. same with how the tapes worked back then but can you remember uh, there being any constraint on the time for the album well cd was 74 minutes at the time mm -hmm. so that was a constraint which was much uh much easier than the vinyl concern. I mean, now, now with the resurgence of vinyl, it's like a real, a real head scratcher sometimes because you want to get everything on, but the more you cram on, the worse the audio is. The way they cut it, it's like having if you if you give it a little bit more space and you keep it down under twenty minutes a side, you'll you have a much better thing. But not everybody wants to do a four side vinyl, uh, so it's like. Um, but yeah, at the time it was more. Yeah, CDs were, I mean, yeah, it was 74 minutes. So that was, most albums, you know, didn't really need to be more than, I mean, I remember when CDs first came out and they were having, um, you know, like bonus things and this is and that's and adding. So I remember listening, like, I got so used to a 45 minute album that uh, hearing a 55 minute album or a 60 minute album, I'd just be like, man, I'm tired of this band. I, don't want to listen to I only want to listen to 45 minutes worth of, this this music maybe the instrumentals got shortened to give them space on the album without having to cut any of them well. i think that's part of it but i do i do think there is another part of it that was like let's not linger like this is a this is a, supposed to be a pop album let's not linger too long let's let's start it and end it but if you're going to do anything in the middle let's not not uh, not stay there too long let's yeah, yeah. let's move on move back to the to the hit Get to the hit. <laughs> so funny. Such a funny time. And funny time to remember that. I have. It's been a long time since I had anybody uh, in the studio talking like that. But back at Bob's, there was a lot of talk about, like you know, get to the get, you know, get to the hook, be quick, get your audience, you know, get to the song, do this. It was always this like, like now everyone's like, yeah, let's just do what we want and see if anybody likes it. You know, who would have been in the control room with you? Well, just the band and David Foster and and me and and Bob Clermont. So nice. Yeah, cool. they, it had you know had a big couch along the back, and um, and David would be sitting up with Bob, and I, me and the band would be in the back, and just kind of listening and watching. It was really fun because it was like I like uh, particularly like David Foster seeing, and I think it was fun just seeing like David Foster having his very very like um, I don't want to say pop approach, but he. He thought of things in that way and Jim kind of had a little bit of both. Um, it was just fun to see how those things got worked out. And I remember David would always uh, push for things to be, he'd have, he'd like to have these kind of dramatic moves. Like he'd ask Bob to push something or make something louder, but he, he, he liked it when it just got like a little bit more obvious than something subtle. And I, that was always something I really um, liked because you always think of mixing like this sort of like you're supposed to be really subtle and tasteful and you know like this like super everything's like supposed to be balanced and beautiful and 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 then uh for david to push bob to do some rides that were like would jump out of this like think the thing would jump out and draw attention to itself mm -hmm. i was like wow that's a really great lesson to learn like like just, just to make something obvious is is also like kind of cool uh and not in a way that draws it not like doesn't make you think of the mixer like i was saying I don't like that, but to have something um, attention grabbing um, in an arrangement sense was was pretty always. I, that was a big thing I learned from from watching David and and, uh, and Bob work together. It was a really fun. I remember it being a, a really fun time and a really fun project. And I remember, like I was saying, everybody was so uh, lovely. Um, and because it was their first album, they were very they were excited. And it was my an early gig for me, so I was very excited. So it was like my memories of it are all very fond and very positive and, and uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that 25 years later, people still want to hear about it and think about it and talk about it. Thank you so much for spending some time today. Um, it's been really, great. My pleasure. it's been really great to uh, catch up about a project that you worked on so long ago now. Um, 
25 years is a long time to try and carve stuff out of the memory of, but um, I think it's been lovely to see it from a mixing level, um, some great insights with, with how Jim and, and David and Bob worked in, in the studio and how you worked alongside them. It's been lovely, really, um, really interesting to hear back. Um, thank you for coming on. Um, all the best for your future endeavors. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a, a pleasure to talk about it and to remember uh, that time and to remember the band and the album. And I'm happy to uh, have been a part of it and to hear that people are still uh, interested in, in hearing about it. They very much are so. There's a huge, huge swathe of fans that's very much take this album to heart and, and love it dearly. So it's um, great to talk about it further and, and encourage that, um, that fandom and that passion for this album, even if it's 25 years old now, it's something to be celebrated, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Music should always be celebrated, especially when it uh, makes people happy and, uh, and improves their lives. It's a great sentiment to end on. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you, Simon. And so ends the second interview for the season. A huge thanks again goes out to Ryan for his trust in allowing me to take of his time and speak to him about his work. It was incredible to hear the insights of how the band worked at a mixing level with Ryan and Bob Clearmountain in the studio. His enthusiasm for the album and his work on it clearly came across. And speaking with him, he was really enthusiastic about this project, especially his sentiments regarding how music should be shared, especially if it brings joy. And it is my hope that this podcast will in part do that for the fans. Thank you for listening. We have a very special guest being interviewed for the next episode. Keep your ears open and I'll no doubt be posting clips and snippets and teasers on social media. Please consider leaving a review and rating wherever you listen to the show, specifically Apple Podcasts if possible. That allows the algorithms to reach out to others. And until next show, you've been listening to Causecast and thanks.